So good morning. Uh, thank you for coming so early in the morning on Sunday morning, church time. Stefan said. <laughs> um, it's this is the last um, conversation of the. This is the last day of the art fair, and it's also the last conversation in of the morning. And so, before starting, I will just um, thank the people who have been working on this series of conversations and salon, starting from Claudio Vogt, who put together and work with us and on practicalities and also more. And my special thanks goes also to the rest of the fair, and in particular to uh, Mirta D'Argenzio, whose help and support and discussions with me were very important for this specific panel. Um, I'm very honored to today to be uh, here moderating this panel. I don't know whether I'm good enough, but uh, I will try to do my best. Um, and I'm honored to have these four um, professionals who have, whose work I've been um, following um, since years, although I didn't know them before. Uh, actually, I met Stefan just this morning. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, this is even better because I had the chance of meeting you all. Um, it will take probably w more like the whole hour just to describe all the, the, the project that they have been working on in there in these years. So well, just for the sake of quickness and to jump into the discussion, I will just mention their names and, and their actual present position. Starting from Marta Kuzma, director of OCA Norway and uh, member of the curatorial team of uh, Next Documenta 13. Julieta Aranda, artist and co-founder of EFLUX, together with uh, Anton Vidocle, artist and co-founder of EFLUX again, and uh, Stefan Kalmar, director of Artist Space New York. Um, the idea of a panel about alternatives, and then we will get into the world. What does it mean? Because you know we had already this brief discussion yesterday. Um, was coming from two uh, reasons. Uh, one was a personal reason. Um, it, it was about, in a way, the questions that I was making together with my colleagues during the foundation of a space that I ran in Milano, which is called People. And, and then the other was a sort of a coincidental, coincidental um, interest by uh, Art Basel in doing a project which would run parallel to the art fair, which ended up to be the EFLUX uh, project in the Kopfbau. Um, so this is the reason why we are here today. Um, of course, we're not, uh, we, the idea was not to talk about the history of alternative spaces, because other people have done this uh, in the recent past. And, and also because uh, you know, uh, would be more interesting for me, and I guess for all the panelists today, to talk more about present situation and, and what can be defined uh, alternative. And first of that, uh, before that, w if we can still use this term, because you know, it's really probably outdated and not valid anymore, because the, the um, term alternative was uh, in a way brought up in the beginning of the 70s, where there was a physical need for um, locations uh, and spaces, physical spaces for exhibiting art that at that time was uh, in a way experimental, so ephemeral or time-based performance videos, etc. While now after 40 years, all these kind of practices are extremely uh, received in every single kind of sector of the art field, so uh, there's no probably reason to um, have any kind of use of this term anymore. Um, so, uh, the uh, first question that I would uh, basically um, start uh, asking to all of you is uh, it's exactly this, the, w the one that is at the bottom of the, of, the, um, of the entire panel, which is also in a way said in, into the uh, title, because the title is a little bit sarcastic. We use the word alternative, but we don't know what alternative means. And what, I what could be alternative means already something that it's always uh, in comparison to something else. And it stayed a sort of a uh, moment of in a um, kind of opposition between um, a state of uh, dominant and subordinate, which probably is not uh, any more valid. So the question, the first question is if we can agree on using another term and what term could be. 
uh, and what kind of the evolution for you of this world and these spaces could be now and what role they have. Uh, and when I, when I speak about spaces, it's not physical space anymore, but more about projects and uh, thinking. Um, so what kind of role they play, what kind of space they offer that is not offered anywhere else in the, in the art world, if it's true or if it's not. So maybe uh, Marta can start and then we move on. Uh, I'm sorry to make you the first, but... <laughs> Um, well, I mean, the, the title is a bit daunting because I think, as you're saying, it's a, it's a little bit um, strange to talk about the alternative in an art fair, but also to talk about the alternative in any given space and time today because it's as if, like, the mainstream has already co-opted the alternative as a strategy of, you know, being alternative and mainstream at the same time. I think it's really difficult to say how we... I mean, we all operate in very different ways in very different contexts. Um, I would hardly call what I operate right now in this given space and time in terms of a foundation alternative. Um, I think that as a professional, I operate in different ways given at different times in different contexts and then I would, you know, it's not like a continuum. Um, but I think what it is, is maintaining a particular subjective position of finding a way to retain certain values to what you're doing, which is a critical position, which is trying to maintain the idea of research behind projects, which is trying to maintain complexity in the face of things being simplified, in the face of, you know, someone telling us who public is, and, you know, sort of making that a very narrow construction and based on whatever our jobs are at any particular time is finding a coordinate or a series of coordinates by which to map a strategy to keep those that that kind of methodology alive. So I mean that as a very general frame I would I would say to begin. Thank you. And Julieta, would you say something about uh, I mean I would I would ask you first the same question to everybody and then we jump more into personal uh, questions or mm -hmm. or uh, so what uh, you, we were talking about yesterday, yesterday about this, and uh, really, we, uh, Marta, you, and me, we agreed on you know that uh, really the, probably that we might need if we need something, we need another uh, word, which is not alternative. Um, and do you have some uh, ideas or? <laughs> I, mean, well, uh, I think that uh, to get fixated on what the term is is not so important. Maybe my. Like the, the one thing that is a bit problematic for me is to think of uh, these things constantly in opposition. And you know, like, okay, that here is the mainstream and here is my practice, what, or our practice, whatever that happens to be. And as Marta was saying, like this constant sense that things are being co-opted. So, I mean, I think what is important is to, to stress the fact that it's possible to operate in parallel, that there are things that, I mean, like <clears throat> when you think about the idea of resistance, for example, right? It's a your modes of, of resistance are going to get co-opted, right? And then you cannot keep doing the same thing again. But what is not co-optable uh, is the need to um, act in a, in a different way somehow. So, um, yeah, um, I mean, like, uh, as to the decide what a term is, I don't know. I mean, like, I could tell you bread and butter, yeah? Like, let, let's call it bread and butter today. Let's call it resistance tomorrow. Let's call it alternative in a... On, uh, you know, it's the term is not so important for me. Yeah, because one thing that I was uh, thinking during uh, while I was reading about uh, and preparing the panel is that there's a constant uh, need for classifying things from, let's say, what we uh, call, uh, even if I don't even like to use this term, but about the, uh, what we call mainstream. Uh, I don't know if if you receive it, but I received uh, an email from uh, the. Uh, new museum in New York, asking for uh, sending information about the space because they are the space in Milano because they are doing a series um, for the next triennial. They are doing a project which is called Art Space Directory, in which they are listing f more than 500 spaces. So there's uh, around the world. So there's still this kind of need of uh, you know classifying and listing. Uh, 
spaces all around the world, which I don't, underst I don't really uh, know whether, where it's coming from, why there's this need, or for example, uh, why there's the need of using, still using these words. So, um, Anton, what do, you, what do you think about that? Uh, yes, is this microphone working? Yes, mm -hmm. I think it is working. Well, it's actually quite interesting. I mean, maybe I have a kind of a two-part answer statement. You know, one thing that's very important to me, and probably to Juliet as well, is that, you know, Eflux is an artist-run something. An alternative maybe is a kind of a problematic term to use right now. I think the microphone is off again. Uh, is it working now? No. no. What about now? Oh, yes. OK. Excellent. We got it. So we're an artist-run, you know, let's say, project. Um, and th there is something very important about that because, you know, artist transfer came into being uh, around the same time as the alternative movement uh, kind of became quite large. I was recently watching uh, this Adam Curtis documentary from BBC. I mean, I don't know how many people know that in 1973, 74, six million people moved out to live in communes. I mean, six millions is probably almost the population of Switzerland to try to develop alternative lifestyle, al alternative economics, alternative agriculture. You know, a lot of people now think that this kind of movement failed, but if we look at it a little bit more closely, like, for example, how alternative agriculture evolved into so organic food movement and, and how dominant it became now, how it completely changed our consumption or our thinking about what we eat, you know? So there, it was quite powerful and quite a significant movement. And of course, it was very much tied into the ideology and a certain kind of politics, the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam War, uh, and many other things. I mean, at the time, just speaking with Martha Rosler, for example, artists were very reluctant to show in mainstream museums because the museums were frequented and supported by corporations. And artists perceived corporations as their class enemies. That simple, you know? So the reason why this alternative and artist transfer came into being is that a lot of people wanted to create a professional circuit where they wouldn't feel compromised or they wouldn't feel complicit in this kind of a entertainment or collaboration with people that they perceive to be their enemy. You know, now we're, of course, in a very, very different situation. But I think it's very, very important that the kind of creativity and the kind of imagination that, that comes from artists starting you know, spaces, projects, enterprises, publications, you know, that that somehow is recuperated and preserved because it does bring the kind of creativity that we don't find in many other sort of sphere or aspects of the art world. But I think I'm giving a very long answer, so I'll no, pass no. it to <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> does it work? Does my yeah. I can no, I, th I think kind of what's interesting, what you pointed out, is that maybe there is something progressively conservative about, uh, about what you are saying, that uh, going back to uh, conservative in, terming, in terms of conserving a moment in history, uh, and looking back at artist-based history, for, for example, it's not so much about uh, becoming new, it's also reconsidering your own legacy. And we were just kind of in with my team joking about next year's 40 years artist space. It's like maybe the slogan should be 40 years artist space and still old school. Uh, there are moments in our history and uh, uh, shared values that set ourselves apart from uh, institutions that are increasingly run as, larger, uh, as, as large corporations. And I think it's that moment of a different practice, a different thinking uh, that is still uh, associated with our common, uh, <coughs> common work. I mean, just uh, just uh, to bring something up, right? In artist space, you have the artist files. So there is this gigantic collection of slides, yeah. um, which is somehow a little bit different from, I mean, it's not the desire to collect and archive and classify things, but simply to make, to create a resource which may be a little bit different from this uh, more corporate idea of assimilating and encompassing and taking in every single small artist-run space. I mean, nothing yeah. against the new museum, but I am a little bit well, skeptical about Obviously, the the, I mean, if we, can say we can, if we can't say it here, we can't say it n nowhere. You know, obviously, there is a framing uh, strategy on behalf of the new museum by co-opting 500 institutions under their new brand. You know, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, this is how it works.
this is why we are here in an art fair discussing it. You know. But that's uh, also, I mean, you were speaking, Anton, about the communities of 1970, which was a different, I mean, Seth Siglob said the art community was a much smaller art community. Um, and it's it, now, what is community in a place like New York City? Yeah. I mean, New York City, what is an artist community when most of the artists are coming in for an interim period of time? They're not people that have been born there logically to that place. Um, the idea of what was artist space in 1970 is a much different organization. Is it now a place like the New Museum is a much different museum than it was when it was run on Lower Broadway? Um, you know, what is it in terms of constituting an artist space? I mean, I was in a, in a, a conference in San Marino three weeks ago um, that was run by Franco Berardi, and it was the launch of something called School of the Social Imagination. Mm -hmm. And 20 kilometers far away from that was another art biennial kind of construction conference of Faenza that was talking about public commissions and the art world within the confines of the art world. Whereas I think Berardi's conference, which was 20 kilometers away, was bringing in <coughs> the head of the Metal Workers Union in Bologna, was bringing in um, uh, a group of students called um, the Knowledge Liberation Front. These were people that were not classifying their spaces as art spaces. They, were classi they, weren't, they weren't nominalizing anything. They weren't selecting to call anything or register themselves. In fact, their freedom was gained from non-registration. It was from non-voluntary you know, voluntary, um, kind of um, being incognito. I think there's something to that as well, is not naming what you're actually doing. Yeah. In I mean, order this to is you know, like the conference or talks that you host in Venice currently, and that was an interesting aspect of Leo Bezzani's talk of, you know, the, uh, that you're forced to define yourself constantly, and kind of our freedom is also uh, to not uh, be classified, to mm -hmm. not let ourselves classified, as rather being sort of polymorphous entities mm -hmm. that don't have to have to name itself, confess itself mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess like the, the, the moment that you recognize yourself and you agree to enter this system of classification, you give yourself parameters yeah. for action, and maybe like uh, you got into something there. I mean, like the, to be able to act as a move, moving target, right? That you are not obliged to be a replicable entity. So that is, I mean, like that is much more interesting than to think about. Okay, so what will we propose instead of alternative? I mean, that's, then that is something that can also be taken over or enters the system of classification in the same way. Um, I would, I would just like to go back to uh, what Anton was saying. Because um, if I well remember, but I can be wrong, uh, but in 2006, 2007, you did this workshop with Pellington in that was three part workshop, one in Istanbul, the other was in um, Berlin, and then in Nicosia, right? And because I read this in, a, in an interview, and you were mentioning that the part of that workshop was exactly to uh, see what the situation of artist-run spaces were at that time in 2006, 2007. Is this correct? Uh, and, yes. and, yeah, yeah. and my question is uh, it's exactly, because um, I don't know the result of that, of that workshop. I know that there was this workshop, but I don't know the result of this workshop. What, and you were mentioning in this, in this interview that you wanted to, um, in a way, talk about why a few new models were uh, coming up in, in 2006. And maybe my question is, is now, this, since you were saying that Eflux is an artist run something, so uh, this kind of openness, uh, did, you did, did you find the situation in 2006 and 2007 different from what it is now, or what is your? Well, uh, first of all, uh, just to give a little bit more background to yeah. what it was, uh, Pelintan is an art historian and a sociologist based in Istanbul, and uh, for a number of years she's been doing a bit of research into uh, artist-run spaces and uh, uh, this whole sphere of act artistic activity. She's very interested in it because artist-run spaces are quite you know, dominant in the Middle East, are quite dominant in, in places where there is not such a strong presence of public art institutions. Yes, So people self-organize, artists who live there self-organize and fulfill all sorts of roles, from curating exhibitions to writing criticism to publishing books to organizing exhibitions you know, fundraising, because there is nobody else to do it for them, yes? So there is a kind of a proliferation of artist-run spaces or artist-founded spaces in 
Egypt, in Lebanon, in, in Turkey, etc., etc. So to, for a while, she's been kind of looking into that. And we wanted to organize a kind of a conference because, um, well, for one thing, it, there was a joke from, there is an artist run space in Istanbul called Pist, run by two young Turkish artists. And when they were uh, trying to start it, you know, I mean, as a joke, they were saying, well, there is like how to learn computer language for dummies. There are these how-to books for just about everything. So they thought that they would find also a book for how to start an artist run space. But of course, that book didn't exist. So of course, it's a kind of a slightly apostolic idea because the whole point, I think, is to actually rethink and imagine what, what is an art space in a city, right? This is precisely what historically artist run spaces were so good at. For example, recently I found out that White Columns, when Gordon Mata Clark started it, was basically just a garage, right? A garage where any artist could have it for a day and do whatever they wanted there. It could be a studio, it could be a display s uh, space, it could be a space of production or a space of just social gathering, right? And it was completely, completely open. Just think about how different that is to what White Columns, for example, is today, which is kind of a completely professionalized institution. This is not really a criticism, but just maybe to point out the radical difference between the kind of model that a lot of artist run spaces adopted now in comparison to the moment of their initiation, yes, which was much more open and experimental. So with Pellin, we wanted to look into, you know, the, a little bit into this process. This uh, workshop, this seminar was sponsored by uh, an NGO organization from Texas, who, as it turned out, they were mainly interested in kind of funding uh, civic, you know, expansion of civic space. So they thought that somehow by enabling us to do this conference and bringing in speakers, that that would solve the problem in, in Diyarbakir, for example, yeah, in this very, very troubled Kurdish region of Turkey. So when they showed up to Istanbul and saw a lot of uh, Western-educated young Turkish artists, they were terribly disappointed and withdrew all funding. Yeah? So that was basically the end of our workshop. Uh, but we're restarting it now in conjunction with there will be a huge summit of artist run spaces that will take place in Vancouver in Canada. Uh, Canada has one of the largest networks of artist run spaces in the world. They have more than 150 artist run centers. And because that country doesn't have so many commercial galleries and relatively few kind of state institutions or public institutions, artist run sphere is incredibly vital for production of visual culture. So, but of course they're running into a bit of a crisis because the kind of, you know, politicized, idealistic, energy that went into creation of, you know, artist run spaces in Vancouver in the late 60s is no longer there. So the idea of this whole summit will be to, to try to reevaluate the situation and invite representative from other artist run spaces from all over the world to have, a, you know, whatever, a, a week-long gathering to see where we're at at this point. So there is no conclusion yet from our project with Bellin. It's been going on for five years. But I'm very, very interested in what will happen in Vancouver in October and what, what can we learn from, from really talking with so many people working in the sphere, you know, in Argentina, in Latin America, Middle East, in Asia, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I would like to, uh, moving from what Anton said about the white columns, because um, <coughs> of course white columns, you know, we know that historically uh, uh, these kind of spaces uh, I don't know how to call them anymore, but uh, uh, where, in a way, uh, New York was the center where everything happened in the beginning of the 70s. And of course, white columns and artist space were kind of, you know, uh, there are, are two uh, different models, but also uh, few, uh, only two of the few that really last in, in these 40 years. So, um, and if you look at the history of the, uh, all spaces in general, it seems that um, there's uh, only two options during the all this th during the length of their their life. Uh, either they turn, as you said, into really professionalized uh, institution, let's say, or they just close down. Um, well, the tendency has been to really relegate the decision making to curators. This is one of the biggest changes that occurred in artist-run spaces. Per, you know, and you could see this very clearly in Canada sometime around, you know, five, six, seven years ago, 
they all change their model towards becoming a kind of a quasi bureaucracy in a sense. Yeah, so there are still artists on the board, but effectively all of the creative decisions are made by a curator, which I think they didn't notice what they were doing, but you know, just from spending some time there, for me it was quite interesting that curators emerged as a very dynamic agent, in a sense maybe more dynamic and more creative than artists. Maybe because the artist kind of stepped back or got tired or something. Uh, so th this is a very, very big change. And artist space, I think it was, it was not really started by artists. It was actually started by curators. It was well, just called artist space. By Irving yeah. Sandler, yeah. art historian. Yeah. 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 But then it's an association of artists also, members, no? Yeah, I mean, we it's still, I mean, like the first yeah. thing that I, for example, did is to kind of to reappoint 50% board members as artists, as active artists, which, you know, like, over uh, the last 15 years, it was more or less people that pay their way on board level. But I think kind of uh, a thinking board is a, is a good board, you know, not necessarily only a paying board. So it's simple things like that. Again, you know, we're working with uh, wage, uh, working artists in the greater economy to find a just payment schedule for artists. I mean, we still pay artist fees and, you know, like, uh, and commission works, which is, you know, like, it's banal but it's essential to find also a different way of sustaining artists living uh, beyond or parallel to uh, uh, commercial gallery systems. And, uh, and what you say, it's like kind of, it's also about deprofessionalizing an institution, you know, and thinking about growth in a different way, you know? I mean, like, yeah, lots of institutions uh, went into, in order to overcome an intellectual crisis, uh, went into physical growth. Uh, and now, you know, you, you have the examples in New York, you know, uh, faced with uh, totally different parameters of operation, uh, where it's really, uh, like, where the new museum works essentially like a Cinemax uh, to a certain degree, and has to sustain its business through entrance figures. And I think there, there are ways of operating uh, that we now have the liberty to learn from that is outside of uh, those modes of growth. Uh, and, you know, I see for us, at least, the artist base still being, in a way, kind of the union club for the artists living and working in New York. Yeah, I would stay just on with you here. Because uh, um, before moving to the artist base, you were uh, director of Kunstverein in Munich. So, which, in a way, it's a model that, of course, is coming from a completely different history, completely different time. But it's in a way, as we said, it's again, it's an association of members. Uh, but what kind of differences? Uh, you know, I know that it's very uh, trivial and banal, but it's actually it's a big. There's there's a difference between. No, the two I mean, models. and the Kunstverein has a history in in the race of the bourgeoisie, and yeah. is a bourgeois club. Uh, the artist base is, in that sense, an association of artists that uh, you know uh, we are not satisfied, happy or underrepresented within an institutional and commercial context uh, in the early 70s and obviously with the growth of the market and the diversification of institutional politics, uh, this has changed drastically uh, in the past 40 years in a way kind of through the work of organizations like Artist Space. Yeah, yeah Marta, <laughs> we go back to you. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, OCA plays for me um, sort of a very interesting role because it's a it's a sort of a um, I would say uh, intermediate uh, institution if I can use this uh, term because um, of course it um, supports artists uh, from Norway to, to go abroad and to to, to exhibit the world and uh, abroad and also to bring people in and you know and uh, making their research in Norway but also uh, you produce your own uh, programming, and, and um, one thing that you really stress in your program, which is the way I read it, is that you put a lot of an attention on public programming, which in this kind of um, spaces has, in a way, always been a little bit undermined, uh, in the sense that when we talk about spaces, or these kind of spaces, uh, whatever we call them, we often uh, use um, we, we often use the term of space just because we think of physical space, but never think about what they do in there, or this is the general, what the general public thinks of. Maybe because the history of spaces is linked to a physical need of a space for exhibiting art. 
while in your case you pro you put you stress a lot of attention to the to the public programming which for me in a way address um, two other kind of goals which is uh, the, a different kind of use of time and and you were mentioning before and you uh, and also the audience <laughs> which is there's a different kind of uh, way in which you know public programming, even like this today, it's uh, are approaching to the to the public. There's a more direct, maybe less mediated than 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 an exhibition thing. Uh, one um, one example, it's exactly and it's symptomatic that in the last Venice Biennial, you your pavilion, but also the Spanish pavilion, was extremely in a way well constructed. This is my of course my judgment about. Um, because they were actually opening um, questions which are not only related to the art world, and all, not only um, uh, they, they were not talking about on, only about things that only the, the small audience of the art world can really listen to. So, there's my question is if it, if you agree with me that that public programming, programming can play in a way the role of uh, moving things around more uh, more than exhibiting art. Well, I think I, I just wanted to go back a bit more what Stefan was talking about, looking into fields of operation, um, because I think we're speaking a lot about in terms of art categories. We're talking about artists, we're talking about curators, we're talking about museums, we're talking about artist spaces. And I think what's happening now with the shifts economically, environmentally, geopolitically, it's really difficult to return to those same categories and identifications as we know them. So at the point of looking into, I mean, maybe the, the idea of public programming is still just to give cells of possible research initiatives and have an institution not talking to your public about what is an art space or not talking to them about who are the validators or who are the mediators, but to say, invite other people in to say, okay, where are the nodes of activity that we're not looking at? So, for example, in one of the discussions for the State of Things, which was the Venice program, we invited um, the, uh, somebody who heads up the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at the London School of Economics. His name is Fawaz Gerges. And he gave a two-hour lecture about how we cannot think of the Arab Spring just as the Arab Spring. There are delineations and differentiations. There is the first, second, and third levels of revolution. There are the first, second, and third ways in regi regionally to look at the Arab world and how these revolutions will happen. Um, there's been a lot of discussions about Facebook being the impetus for the revolution when, in fact, he gave a dissection of that um, movement and said it's actually Al Jazeera. And Al Jazeera, from being a very small media network, turning out to be a much more important media network not only in the Arab region, but in the world. I mean, these are things that we should be paying attention to when we construct a cultural space. And I think what's happening is we're closing ourselves down and looking at mediators and people that are still within the system as we know it, the people that are graduating from curatorial programs. You know, maybe the curatorial programs should not be called curatorial programs anymore. Maybe they need to bring in sociologists, economists. I mean, things are really melting down around us, and yet we still go forward and still look at the same kind of um, genres. So I'm, I'm just, I think the point of the public programming is to not only look forward and not only look at those pulses of what are going on internationally and those pockets of change, but also having, as you know, Stefan was calling, an old school approach, looking at you know, revisionary models, looking at revisionary histories, so that when we're looking at what's happening in terms of contemporary art in India, we're not just looking at somebody born after 1970, but we're looking at how Nasreen Mohammedi worked and how it was possible for her as an Indian modernist, as a woman, to work within you know, Bangalore, for example, or Charlotte Posenenska. What was very implicitly unique to Charlotte Posenenska's project that had her testing the grounds of art production to finally fall away from it from 1968 to become a sociologist, or Lee Lozano, for that matter, um, or Gordon Matta-Clark, who decided to go work with Lotto Continua. I mean, 
maybe we shouldn't be looking at what he was doing in white columns, maybe we should look <laughs> at the other kinds of activities in paces, because just as artists were acting against, were working in institutional critique in the 1970s, they were as well fighting against the Vietnam War, which perhaps was the more important impression issue at that time. Thank you. Julieta, um, for what is my, my reading, um, there's, you know, just going back briefly to the, um, these 40 years of, uh, from 70s to now, um, there have been, uh, and we, we said this, maybe we uh, mentioned this very briefly, um, there has been a closing, uh, the relationship between and the distances between spaces in general, like different uh, cate categor categories of spaces in the art world have been, in a way, um, are now shorter and shorter. And I think, but this is, again, my, my reading, and I hope to get uh, your viewpoint, that Iflux, so the two of you, but maybe starting with Julieta, um, has been a very important uh, moment um, for this. In a way that the idea of, you know, um, announcing and, and being like communicating what was happening in, in the system made a lot of people to know what was going on, let's say, to Beijing or to South of Italy. And people from, I don't know, from the centers got to know what other people elsewhere were doing. And probably kind of um, these things made uh, sort of open up uh, collaborations and, and or they had also, let's say, they, they offer a way to, for other people to know what um, what to do, what other possibilities to do are, just because they were presenting a wider um, uh, spectrum. Uh, but my my question uh, was has always been the same was for let's say for the flux video rental because in a way it gave the possibility to no matter what kind of places to show, they were going to be to 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 have a, the same project in or you know to to get. Um, involved in the same kind of, in an history of a project. Uh, so my question for you is, was this kind of a goal that came directly from the idea of starting Eflux, or it came in a way as a consequence of the using of Eflux? So the, the idea is a cause or, no, or an effect, this well, kind of? Well, I, mean, like I think that uh, things are a little bit more organic <laughs> than that, no? It's not that I think we ever had a board meeting and said, okay, this is what Influx is going of to course. do. Of course. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no such a thing as a board. But, um, but I mean of I course, being, being an artist run uh, something again, you know, of course there was a, there was a goal for, for which um, I yeah, There was a need, but that's need, a very uh, different yeah. thing. Um, I mean, like, to, to take it a little bit from where Marta mm -hmm. was, right? What happens somehow is that uh, the artistic community becomes a culture of display where you are looking very much at the finished product, but you don't look at the conditions of production. So in that sense, you can see this like very, uh, I don't know, like to do Walid Rad's work, right? Which is uh, um, uh, the Atlas group is this very beautiful poetic things, but you don't, you don't realize that there is actually the, uh, of this Anton, uh, Anton knows more, but like this, uh, uh, a profoundly integral part of the work, which is to create an imaginary of the conditions of Lebanon, right? And that's, uh, that, that's like the part that you don't look at. You end up just looking at the, I don't know, like the Atlas uh, group videos of a sunset. And there, is, like, there are inherent, uh, inherent conditions there. So um, I think with Eflux, uh, we both may have different, because we often have different uh, ideas of what it is that we are doing together. Um, something that happened is like that uh, all of a sudden Eflux uh, uh, presented us with the possibility of being able to disseminate um, a lot of information about what was going on and it generated in turn um, a change of how press releases were being structured, right? So from it being simply something that would say, okay, such and such institution is pleased to announce uh, such and such artist and here it is the photograph, uh, it actually started cons uh, explaining much more where the work was coming from. And that sort of, I mean, it became an archive by itself in a natural way over the years of uh, accumulating. 
And uh, to tie it up with the video rental, when we started the project, it was this sense of what happens if you try to make an open archive, right? The, um, the idea of making the video rental as a project that would sort of pass a judgment about the video production of the early 2000s was not so interesting as much as to think the more that this project circulates, the more videos that will get added to it and the more difficult it will become to say this is what was happening in this period of time. I'm going to pass this on to Anton now. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll just give a more uh, kind of a, just a simple pragmatic answer. No, these things were completely accidental and we kind of learned from what happened. The way EFLUX was started was a pure accident. Nobody yeah. planned it. There was no biz strategy or business plan. It's just that... But did you ever find this kind of... Mm -hmm. The reading I'm doing, did you ever mm. think about uh, that this was happening actually and that probably things, oh, I know that things are very organic and it's not, not, not only uh, the, uh, the entire um, social system was, is constantly changing so it's not only related to what Eflux is doing but also add main, main, many other things but did you ever think about that, that this could have been a sort of a push for uh, people to, to uh, do things together and to, to, to kind of being part of the same kind of uh, process? Well, you know, I don't know. I didn't think about it so explicitly. I did think about it once. I, I uh, was uh, at the very beginning when Reflux was just started. I spent the summer in Colombia in a very small town called Pereira, which is where the Andes split into kind of northern and southern part. And it's a town of about a million people, an agricultural place, and it has a tiny community of artists, maybe about a dozen in all, uh, conceptual artists and performance artists. And they, I met them because I was married to somebody from that town. And uh, in a way, like it was quite interesting because they were so isolated at the time. You couldn't really access so much information on the internet. And after spending quite a bit of time with them, I thought that how incredibly unfair it was that the information traveled to them of such a delay. Like, for example, if you're a mathematician and you only find out about you know, somebody's discovery 10 years later, you could spend a decade working out the same problem, which has already been solved. Yeah? So as an you know, art practitioner, to always have this five, 10 year delay seemed just an incredible disadvantage. So part of the project, I think, for me was really to try to maybe equal the playing field a little bit and, and, and give some kind of accessibility, at least on the level of information, to people for whom it was quite difficult, actually, because you know there, there, are, there is no like a Museum of Contemporary Art or an artist-run space <coughs> or a good bookshop that gets all of the interesting publications from, you know, that come out and stuff like that. It's, you know, maybe once in a while art forum appears there and it's shared between 50 and 20 people, you know? So <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I also want to give an example of, I was running a very small program called WPA with no money in 2000. And I, it was also public programs. And I was thinking, how am I going to afford like the art forum printed matter in order to get this information out? And it was like an email to Anton who was like saying, okay, I think it was like, you know, $200, you can get like this distributed by and it was an amazing thing because then yeah. that small little program suddenly made the appearance of having a much bigger budget yeah. because its, it's information and the programs were getting out on a, on a very major level. And meanwhile, we were a staff of two and it was a real way in order to give life to smaller organizations and not to be dominated by, you know, yeah, for example, exactly. the larger institutions. So it was done on that, you know, it was like whatever you can afford to give us, you know, at that time. So it was really making a difference 11 years ago, you know, for a lot of very smaller organizations that needed to get visibility, for Step example. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. But you, you were saying um, it also leveled out the playing field. So 10 years on, or how long is EFLEX around now? 12. 12 years. Do you think it's still a strategy that you would approach in the same way today? Well, f I think, you know, things change all the time. I think for people, you know, reading about contemporary art that still fulfills the same function. But of course, now there is a second very important addition to it, which is Eflux Journal, which is something that we started with Brian Kwan Wood and Julieta uh, about three years ago. It's almost three years now. It's which, three years. Yeah, which, uh, so there is another layer to, to all of this that's 
quite important for us. It's a really big commitment. But again, th there was no plan to start a journal like we did this United Nations Plaza project yeah. in Berlin. And uh, through that, two things became very apparent, that there was an incredible audience, like there was a need for these discussions, for this public seminars, for this kind of really dense material, which is not entertaining, which is not you know, fun somehow, but is kind of very vital for artists and critics and curators to, to be able to encounter and discuss. So putting it in printed format allowed to disseminate it in an easier way because you didn't have to come, you don't have to come to Berlin to participate in a discussion anymore, yes? Um, I mean, I think also a bit of a difference is that of course, Eflux comes, comes in and it, it levels the playing field so that everybody has access to information, but not everybody has the same problems. So that becomes evident after 10 years of doing something that the conditions upon which people are operating are vastly different. So knowing about, um, I don't know, a certain kind of conceptual art being realized in New York will not necessarily have the same impact elsewhere. And the journal actually is like the one place where it's possible to bring out this uh, level of uh, particular and the singularities into the... I guess that's what I was hinting yeah. at. as kind of how do you, mm -hmm. in, in a world of randomness, how do you insert meaning? You know, yeah. I mean, this is what we all but try it, to it do. It changes, and, yeah. You know, and make our criticality here, uh, and, you know, uh, and create a space that it differs mm. from things that surround us, but yet contribute to change that what surrounds us. Yeah, no, I mean, in terms of Eflux, it's been interesting. I mean, the most interesting shift that I saw or addition to it was the art and education. Because at that time, I was saying, OK, there's an economic collapse going on. Institutions are going to have to reformulate what is education within their departments. I mean, it's not going to be children's education. The funding is going to come from education. And exhibitions are going to have to be formulated within departments of education. So I, th I think there's going to be a revisionary thinking about that framework, which inevitably actually did happen. You had s like the the surplus and the, 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 the actual purge of programming that was happening with that kind of educational mandate happened substantially in the last two years. And then all of a sudden you see art and education not only being a place of where ac academies are placing programming, but where exhibitions are being announced. And so that morphing into the educational scope was an interesting one. So for in terms of EFLUX, it, it becomes a kind of um, you know, I, I want to be like Pierre Bourdieu and look at it as a kind of, you know, scientific <laughs> analysis in terms of what has happened in the last five years, because I'm sure it's oh, be economical. Like as an economical yeah. model, hugely fascinating. You know, I mean, you, yes, you run it as an enterprise, but yet uh, you create activity with a revenue that uh, has its own venue, its own criticality, and we do distribute the earnings in a very different way than, than other economical models. Gosh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's too positive. <laughs> Maybe there is some critique from the audience. Or yeah, $600 is that too that expensive. Would be, that would be uh, the materialist, theoretical advice of, of the journal and uh, many of the clusters uh, theoretical activity. Um, can you repeat? Sorry. Uh, yeah, we should probably open it up a bit more now. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have it. <laughs> can't you have can't it. have the critique. <laughs> no, it still, still is. Maybe <laughs> um, uh, you want to use this one. Right? Since you asked for critique, I, I couldn't help but notice in looking at Eflux Journal a lot of the activity. And you went way back, what you said earlier, when you began to talk about the work, you talked about and the idea of artwork very often as a material object, even though very often artwork is not a matter of a material object, as you well know from your own writing. So what, what puzzles me sometimes, and, and uh, I think maybe this comes from Boris Groys, I don't know, but what puzzles me sometimes is that I notice in Eflux and a lot of its discussions, this idea of an emphasis on art in its material aspect in its aspect of something that comes from a means of production, 
rather than art as an object of contemplation. This is my impression very often from looking at the sort of emphasis that happens in a lot of the writings that I see in the journal, which I think uh, certainly are of indubitably very high quality in the manner of their expression. Yeah. On to pleasure, Hugo. <laughs> me? Uh, yeah, abs absolutely. But, you know, I mean, uh, for me, that's... Uh, it, uh, we're fascinated with conditions of production rather than a, a kind of a connoisseurship of a, an object as, as, a, an, as an object of... Con art object as an object of contemplation. Excuse yeah. Me, but, yeah. But, <laughs> the matter of art as an object of contemplation, I would think, is very different from the matter of connoisseurship. Why? Connoisseurship is concerned with all sorts of art historical elements. The, art, the matter of art as an object of contemplation is something very different, I think. Don't you agree? Well, would you like to... Uh I mean, yes, the, uh, the, the matter of art is an object of contemplation. Are you, are you talking about a Kant? Do you want more Kantian interpretations? Uh, it has the... nothing to do with Kant, <laughs> but it has to do with analysis. Aesthetic experience? It has nothing to do with Kant, but it has something to do with analysis. Right? In other words, it, it has to do with simply the meaning, the aspect of its meaning. That meaning is not necessarily derived from the matter of its production or whether it's a material object. It has to do entirely with its meaning and with its analysis. That, it seems to me, is a more appropriate di dichotomy than talking about connoisseurship, which is a sort of uh, uh, bourgeois idea about, uh, uh, th that's very often associated with art history and its relation to value in a marketplace. No, I'm talking about something quite different, which has to do with meaning. Uh, you could say its semiotic aspect, if you will. Yeah. Well, there is a kind of a two-part answer to this. One part is that, Part of the inspiration for the journal was maybe the kind of a fiasco of the last documented this journal magazine project that they tried to do, which in the beginning I thought it was an absolutely brilliant idea, kind of a babble tower of art magazines, art journals from all over the world, because all of them are kind of like the small think tanks that in a way are maybe one of the most important things for me that actually exist of an artistic sphere, right? But then what Documenta basically did, instead of asking them what, what is urgent for you, what, what are you thinking about, what, what are the practices in, 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 in where you work, you know, they sort of dictated to them these three sort of questions, yeah, which were documented themes, so they kind of flattened everything into making 80 independent think tanks all sort of kind of reflect on Documenta and being like the band playing, yeah. Uh, for, for a document, and then they even told them that, well, maybe we will publish it, maybe we will not publish it, we're not going to fund it, so they be essentially used the resources of all of these independent journals to do something which was not so good in the end. So what we learned from that, or what the idea that it gave me, would it, it would have been fantastic if it was just done vice versa. If resources were given to practitioners working in all of these different locations to just define zones of urgency that they find important and make it visible to a much larger you know, readership, to a much larger audience, right? So in a sense, on a small scale, this is what we try to do. What, what comes in, maybe this, there, is not, there are not so many essays that specifically have to do with particular art objects, you know? Because the urgencies of these people that we have been publishing from Beirut, from many different parts of the world, are slightly different, you know? And we kind of created a place, a, platform of the, where, where that can find a multitude of readers, yeah? So I don't know if that answers your question, but this is our approach. In that way. Yes, and I think that the moment, for example, speaking about Franco Berardi, I recently spent a couple of days with him in Frankfurt, and he told me that recently he's been writing on Pasolini. Yes, and it's very, and that's very, going to be very a lecture in September, a state I of really? things. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. He's talking about Pasolini as a projection of the present-day Berlusconi kind of Italian So for us, situation. it would be really fascinating to, to publish his writing on Pasolini as... You can't. Oka's uh, publishing uh, that uh, book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is where there's a monopoly. <laughs> and, and, uh, I, I think, just to say something, it's not that what we are doing is opposed to the idea of an aesthetic experience. It's, it's complementary. I, hopefully. We can talk about that. So any more criticisms or questions or uh, attacks? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, actually, neither, but I wanted to get the panels. Can you hear me, actually? Is it clear? Um, I'm, I'm Victoria Preston. I'm a contemporary art historian. And I wanted to ask the panel's view of uh, what was happening at the last San Paolo um, documentary, you know, the project by Roberto Jacobi that was censored. And w what were the real reasons for the censorship? Um, no because this, uh, well, that's the, because, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is the Argentinian artist that was working about the Brazilian elections. And it was completely unclear. I mean, like, this was really murky. And um, uh, apparently what happened is that the curators of the biennial claimed that they were not aware of the content of the work. So uh, the, it's, it's similar to the Sharjah Biennial, very, very, uh, like strikingly similar. So what happened is that uh, they, came in, they came in, they saw the work, they, I guess, got some political pressure, decided to close it, and uh, it was, I, I, did, I never, I was not so Paulo, I don't this, it, it was no video and photographs, and it had to do, and it was under, behind the curtain. So they offered a kind of compromise where they would show the work behind the curtain, and the reason for that was that the work was, uh, they were not aware of the content, which is a little bit hard to believe since the work is featured in the catalog of the biennial. So it's, uh, that's uh, a hard one to pull, but it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we got into a little bit of a tiff because we published a negative review of the, uh, of, of the uh, act of censorship, and yeah, that's, I mean, like, the only thing now, thinking about it, it's, it's that it just reminded me very much of the censorship of the, which you know about that, the Sharjah, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, I have no, I have no sense about that, except that there was a lot of, uh, um, how do you say it, uh, insistence that we would back up at some point, the curatorial team, which I did not feel comfortable doing at all. So I think by now they hate us a little bit, um, but it's okay. The, the reason I asked the question, I think it's very interesting because what was the problem really, um, this idea of the biennial being a platform for critique. And you talked a lot about, um, it's not just about the art, it's about um, activist purposes and principles. It's about, um, uh, uh, it's about sociologists and economists getting involved. Those are where the zones of urgency are. And particularly in, in, in this project, um, you know, it, it was about, on the one hand, this idea of using the Biennale as a platform of critique. But at the same time, there was this hypocrisy because the curatorial statement said that, you know, art and politics are, are, fellow, are, are, are bedfellows, you know, they belong together. And then there was this reaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions? Um, I have a question that probably sounds more critical at first sight than it is, but it's a question about purity. Um, now, when the panel was introduced, there was this discussion of uh, um, how the very notion of the alternative is a little bit passe because galleries do anything now, um, which struck me as not necessarily disingenuous, but I mean, galleries do performance and a lot of produced material that they can't sell as, as lost leaders. That is, they're a marketing wing of a business that uh, centers itself around perhaps them promoting more saleable items that come further down the production chain. Um, so alternative practices are, even if they don't result in immediately uh, marketable things, facilitate the business model of the gallery as a whole when it's in the context of a gallery. In the context of an art fair like this, um, Eflux is an artist-run project, then it sort of sits in a sort of unusual framing where it's uh, um, potentially just by the sort of guilt by association compromised by its presence at Art Basel. And that's not exclusive to Artflux, uh, Eflux, that's ex across the board. I'm really curious about how that then, how you then make those decisions when you get an invitation to something like this, how do you then weigh it up, when do you when do you toss it in the waste paper basket? When do you say yes? What are the rationalizations for saying yes? What would make you say no? Um, yeah. We were invited out of space to do what you're doing now, and we said no. no. 
Uh, no, we said yes because uh, it was kind of a very interesting situation, basically. There is an abandoned building here, or emptied building, yeah, which is about to be demolished, actually. Demolition starts on Tuesday. Uh, so, uh, and it was a possibility, basically, to do whatever we wanted and to have a budget and to bring uh, a lot of different people to come to this location and, you know, kind of do things together, yeah, which includes young artists and students from Städtischule and from Goldsmith and um, a rock and roll band of art critics. And so it was really very, very strange, four or five days, completely confusing, where you had to com totally negotiate your relationship you know, within this strange building, but also to the rest of the fair, to the rest of the shows at Basel, to, you know, you look out the window and there is thousands and thousands. I, I heard that there was a stampede at the VIP opening. Uh, somebody was trampled because people were so anxious to enter the, 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 and we had hardly any visitors during the day, but then at night, there has been so many people trying to come to this informal bar that we're on on the roof that basically there was a line outside like queuing up or calling us at three in the morning. So it was a very confusing, very paradictory, contradictory experience. But what was really fascinating that it actually worked very well as a place for production. Yeah, for example, La Stampa wrote a new song. Yeah? Uh -huh. uh, there were a lot of students self-organized seminars and discussions and many, many other things. So it paradoxically, uh, it, it worked quite well, I thought. And, I mean, like, you, you know, to go, to go back to, it's not entirely disingenuous, but I think it's quite healthy to put yourself right in the face of the thing you claim to be antagonistic to and be like, okay, so if I'm thinking about modes of instrumentalization, what happens if I come in and, it, and I try to act and then you can examine later. I mean, like, I think, I think we will know exactly how, how we feel once we are wrapped up and back home and we say, okay, so what exactly happened, right? And what it is our feeling, and where we, you know, like to what point uh, was there a friction? To what point was there an indifference? To w how do we position our practice the, uh, in in this context? It's not only something that we can speculate about, but it does not hurt to do it every now and then. A few more. <laughs> <laughs> you ask. <laughs> We're late. <laughs> Minutes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the panel for such enlightenment. Uh, now I have a very small question. Uh, it's actually the question arose from the previous conversation just now. Uh, about what you talk about, what happened here with Eflux. Uh, some years ago, I was at Documenta. And then uh, I checked out a lot of things, just even outside Documenta. And it was my first experience at Documenta. was very interesting. But anyhow, I also found out that there was a parallel event, which is not surprising. But the event was trying to do something in contrary with Documenta, uh, meaning that people who cannot get into Documenta, uh, they get into this non-Documenta. I think it was, co if, correct me if I'm wrong, it's called like not Documenta. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it created such an upheaval, uh, even stampede. That, that was the word that uh, evoked this question. And it's, you know, people uh, that from a very small group grew to a very huge group and it even try to be an annual affair. So our curiosity, I visited, and it was like quite interesting. So my question now is very simple. Will E-Flux do this? Thank you. No stampede. No stampede. There was one more. Last one, yeah. No. Uh, to, to just a question earlier in the audience, um, just about a kilometer around the corner, uh, there are 20 artist groups who did a, uh, a map of what's happening in Basel. Uh, that's actual independent groups who fund themselves or are using web-based organizations like Kickstarter or uh, USA Artists to crowdsource and, and create actual open source t ways of uh, organizing themselves. And, and I think it, it's, it's kind of interesting that not very often the, the internet or the web itself is brought up in such discussion because there's quite a lot of activity happening there. And um, for instance, 
uh, there's a, a organization called Collective Show, which I'm part of, which is uh, collectiveshow.org, or helps organize um, artist-run spaces in, in cities. And, um, and there are lots of also distributed collectives that work on the web. So I'm curious to hear more about what you see uh, happening on the web and how that becomes, I think, literally a, a third space or a third sphere of economic activity that supports art. No, you can't do that. You do that. <laughs> no, you can. No, you do that. You. <laughs> I'm not competent to answer. Yeah, I'm really strangely ludite with the web, you know? Uh, uh, <laughs> I know it's, it's a paradox, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. It works. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a good answer for you, but... There is one last question over there, no? Um, hello, my name is Alda Galsterer, and I have only one question that I was wondering about, like, after all these, uh, after your conver uh, conversation and after all the other questions, and after, like, saying that there are artists here that also do alternative, you know, what we were questioning at the beginning, but, uh, and organizing themselves. Um, there are also like a lot of places where artists organize themselves in Basel and sometimes we, I'm very impressed with the panel and I really uh, love to, to meet everybody on the panel, but um, sometimes we, we look at the global and we forget the local and there could have also been somebody invited from the Basel community and to present, for example, their own space here and how they function, that also would have been an interesting point. Not for now, but perhaps for a future uh, panel, you could think about that. That is just a suggestion. Yeah, you, it, there's, it's my fault. <laughs> well, no, it, I'm, no not, I'm not talking about say. fault, you know. <laughs> no, I, no, I'm kidding, it's, but it's, it's true. Like, you're right. Uh, it would, it would be have been extremely interesting, interesting and you're right, but um, you know, you have, um, some kind of urgency that uh, you want to kind of highlight and you know I thought this was a of course. wonderful uh, group of people to bring in. It uh, is, I'm it is. I'm not saying the contrary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Thank it was you. a pleasure. Thank you.